By providing space for constant evolution, we can all transform how we view ourselves and the world around us. Hello, everybody. My name is Whitney Romer, and I'm the education supervisor at a zoo here in Santa Barbara. Above that role, I'm a zoologist, an educator, and a lover of wildlife. I've worked at several different facilities, volunteered at wildlife rehab centers, aided in conservation work, and have been to some of the most beautiful, biodiverse parts of the planet. And I love to share with people the wonders of our wild world and ways that we can learn from it and protect it. Uh, so today I want to talk about, uh, today I want to empower you to find your love and connectedness with our wild world and give you the tools and resources so that you can participate in conservation in your everyday life. Better yet, I can give you a place in your community that can offer all of that to you. And that would be the modern zoo. And I say modern zoo because there are lots of different facilities with different goals. And some aim to put their money where their mouth is and grow and learn from dark pasts of menageries and privately owned exotics. Uh, I want to tell you what a good zoo is and I challenge you to find it and let it help you do good as well. First, I want to talk about how we got here and your experiences. I want everyone in the audience to close their eyes now. And I want you to envision a zoo. What are you seeing? Are you seeing small dark cages? Are you seeing Tiger King styles of cub holding? Are you seeing zoo camp? Are you seeing beautiful botanical gardens and habitats? Well, all of the things that you're seeing are based on either what you've experienced, what you've heard from other people, or what you've seen on social media. So now you can open your eyes. Uh, so I want to talk about why you've experienced that. So if you haven't been to a zoo in over a decade, it's changed a lot in the last couple years. And I encourage you to go to one of our new zoos now to see how much it's different. So the concept of a zoological garden began as a menagerie of privately owned exotics for the wealthy for the sole purpose of entertainment with very questionable welfare. You might recall stories of bear fights and elephant ridings and small concrete boxes for cages. Unfortunately, there are still places like that in the world. Uh, maybe their, their intent is good. They want to observe the beauty of our planet, but their execution is poor. And if you're planning on still going to a facility that does baby lion cub holdings or, or rides elephants or a county fair that will randomly have exotic animals, I encourage you to rethink uh, what you're supporting. Uh, it is in our nature to want to connect deeply with animals, to want to touch them, feed them, and befriend them. While recognizing boundaries, especially with these non-domestic animals, we can use that to help us build the all-important connectedness that we deeply require, but many of us lack in our everyday life. To find out if a zoo near you is with the times is to find out if it's accredited by the AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And that's an accrediting body uh, that identifies these high priority conservation species, creates conservation programs, as well as creates rules and regulations for zoos to follow, and acts as a genetic dating service to help these populations stay stable. Uh, these guys uh, have something called TAGS, T-A-G-S, the Taxon Advisory Group. And that's a group of geneticists and biologists and conservationists and zoo curators that get together and talk about which animals should go where, what zoos have the best resources, who's best to breed. And that plan they come up with is their SSP, their Species Survival Plan. And I got to go to one of these really crazy meetings when I used to be a red wolf zookeeper. Uh, there's a lot of debating back and forth, uh, and it's pretty heated. It was really, really cool also when I used to be a rhino uh, zookeeper and we decided that it would be best for one of our boys to move out west. He was living with his brother. He wasn't really getting along, you know, as we all do with our siblings. Uh, so I was sad to see him go, but really excited to find out that he was getting a girlfriend. Uh, I recently reached out to that facility and found out he has a different girlfriend now. Uh, and he still hasn't felt the need to reproduce, but we're hoping that he will soon because that facility works with the International Rhino Foundation, which is an organization that focuses on the conservation of rhinos and human care in the wild and has reintroduction programs. So that answers kind of another question as well as how these zoos get their animals. So they're transferred from facility to facility for the purpose of breeding, uh, if they're older, to find their kind of forever partner, or to find a zoo that maybe has better resources. So they're not bought and sold. And if the animal was born in the wild, they would, uh, would have been rehabilitated. So they either had a medical illness that was, was too great to have it survive out in the wild, or they've imprinted on humans and have a dependency on them. 
the San Diego Zoo also has a really great program for the northern white rhino. Uh, these guys are functionally extinct. There's only two females left on the planet. But that's not the end for them because they have a program called the Frozen Zoo, which houses 10,000 living cultures for over 1,000 species, ready to help bring them back from the brink of extinction. And if that sounds crazy to you, that's because it is. Uh, and I highly suggest doing some research into the Frozen Zoo and things that zoos are doing for our wild populations. Uh, Black-footed ferrets. Zoos are doing incredible things for local species, and these guys are a great example. So black-footed ferrets are, were thought to be extinct. They're the most endangered mammal in North America. And that is until a small population of 18 was found, and zoo conservationists got to work. It started as a breeding program in Wyoming, and since then, the Smithsonian National Zoo took over. As of 2021, they have raised 1,029 of these ferrets to 28 different release sites in the US, Canada, and Mexico, releasing about 150 to 220 every year. A favorite local story of mine is with the Channel Island foxes. If you've been out to the islands, you might have seen them. They are only found on the Channel Islands, and unfortunately, their population dropped by 90%, with only 15 foxes left on Santa Rosa Island. Well, the Santa Barbara Zoo, with partners like US Fish and Wildlife, the Nature Conservancy, and the National Park Service, had helped bring these guys back from extinction. And as of 2012, three of these subspecies were removed from the federal endangered species list, making it the fastest conservation success story on the entire list. That also parallels another story with the California condor. So the California condor in the 1980s, there was only 22 individuals left on the whole planet. And because of zoos like the LA Zoo, Santa Barbara Zoo, San Diego Zoo, Oakland Zoo, and Oregon Zoo, as well as partners, uh, we now have over 500 with over 300 flying free in the wild. Uh, our teams, our zookeeping teams, our vet teams are still going out to the wild all the time, especially with the island fox, to continue medicating, vaccinating, and monitoring these populations to make sure that they're still stable. Uh, the AZA has al also added more and more regulations to current zoo habitats that maybe made, would have made us question welfare in the past. In 2002, my home zoo, the Detroit Zoo, uh, ended their elephant program. And that's because they felt that they did not have the space to give the elephants their mobility needs. In 2011, following that, the AZA made it regulated uh, that you needed to have a certain amount of space for elephants as well as up to five or more elephants to give them their best welfare. And while huge areas like San Diego Safari Park have 2,000 acres for their elephant area, uh, the smaller zoos like Santa Barbara Zoo have since discontinued their program. In just my lifetime, zoos have changed so much. They have added conservation and education programming, habitat upgrade, uh, upgrades, holistic enrichment, uh, uh, enrichment uh, as well as so many other things. And I'm sure in just 10 more years, zoos will have changed so much. So why do we need to find a way to connect people to animals? Animals from all over the world, ones that you may never encounter in your everyday life. Well, we need to think about this. To live on the planet, you are either a fungus, a bacteria, a plant, or an animal. And I believe that lets us all fall into the animal category. We have our wild neighbors, and we all need the same things. We need shelter, food, clean air, clean water, a clean planet. Once we start recognizing that there's ways to live sustainably, ways to coexist with the natural world, one that we're a part of, uh, we can find that connectedness. That connectedness will help turn our feelings into love, empathy, compassion. Uh, and then we can think about ways that we can conserve uh, animals like the one in this picture, the vaquita. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of the vaquita. Ooh, a couple of people. Uh, well, they're an amazing cetacean, the smallest porpoise in the world, and there's only 10 left. They're critically endangered. Well, now you know, and maybe now you care, but usually that's the extent of it. Just a dark thought in the back of your mind that something bad is happening. But what are you going to do? Stop using plastic straws? <laughs> well, what if I told you there's places that are doing something about it, places that are funding research, sending conservationists, and educating the public for all the things that they actually can do? Well, that place would be the modern zoo. Most facilities will have call to actions everywhere to let you know exactly how you can save each and every species they have. So here are a couple for you guys. When shopping at the grocery store, switching to sustainable seafood helps save Humboldt penguins, the vaquita, and countless marine mammals and birds. 
If you're buying snacks or cosmetics, choosing things without palm oil or with sustainable palm oil will help primates like gibbons and gorillas. If you are recycling or if you have broken phones, chargers, tablets, recycling that helps save gorillas as well. If you are shopping for produce, shopping local and organic farmers markets not only helps your human neighbors, but increases local biodiversity and limits pesticide runoff into the ocean. There are so many places that you can volunteer for beach cleanups and wildlife rehab centers and participate in citizen science, like going out listening to frog calls or doing monarch counts. Zoos are not the only place you can start your conservation journey, but they're a great place to learn, out, to learn how to. The drive to preserve our natural world is only strengthened by future generations like the students here. We live in a beautiful place where there's so many options to participate in conservation. Local beaches, parks, museums, wildlife rehab centers all have options. We can help our wild neighbors in the oceans, in the forests, on the coasts, on the islands, all over. We are so privileged to live somewhere so beautiful where we can do so much good. Now I want you guys to all close your eyes again and imagine just what you're going to do to help. Thank you. <laughs>